Welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. I am Helen Pedroso. I am ADP List Community Manager and I'm super happy to be here with everyone today, um, especially our your, we have very special people with us here today. This is a very special moment for all of us. Um, we're partnering with Maze and we have some really, really special people that are gonna tell you about this amazing project, a playbook that ADP List is partnering with Maze and doing. And we're super, super happy to welcome Ash, Bezod and Carolina. Um, Ash is gonna talk to you about all of this in a little bit. But I just wanted to do our, our intro and welcome everyone as community manager in ADP List. So you may know that ADP List is now with over 6,000 mentors in 140 different countries and we're growing every day. Our community is growing every day with mentees everywhere too. So this is a very large community. We're very happy to have all of you in it. And as I said, this is a very special project. Uh, it's a UX research playbook um that over 30 mentors were featured in so we are very very happy to introduce ash who is ux designer and design advocate at maze and bezod bezod uh is the founder of yet another studio where he works with organizations of all sizes to build intentional, responsible, and sustainable practices of learning. He's also an executive in re residence at Reforge, where he builds and leads the user insights for product decisions program. So uh, I will pass it on to Ash now and yeah, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for the, for the warm introduction. Hello, everybody. Super stoked to be back here at ADP List and to be joined by my friend, Bezad Sarjani. Bezad, how are we doing? <laughs> Good morning. I'm, I'm so excited to be doing this today. The, I'm excited just the, the book coming out like this has been a dream. So I'm yeah, excited it's, to chat. It's super exciting. We were actually um, just joking around yesterday uh, about gifts, and I was going to tell you that, um, that I wanted to use a Beyonce gift uh to make a joke on twitter about being with bay today but <laughs> settled on one from saved by the bell instead they, they so, both would have been appropriate but i'm glad this the saved by the bell one led to a good conversation <laughs> totally anyone who follows me on twitter knows that my media is mostly just gifts um so as Helen just mentioned, today is a really big day for both of us. The collaboration between Maze and ADP List brings you the playbook, Democratizing Research to Deliver Impact at Scale. So you can head over to Product Hunt and you can actually, um, I'm just gonna drop the link in the chat here. If you haven't already checked it out, um, I will drop that in here. There you go. And we'd really love to, you know, get your support, hear what your thoughts are. Um, it is definitely um, a huge feat, as Helen had mentioned, Bezad in combination with 30 plus mentors and UX leaders from ADP List contributed to the playbook. And we really wrote this playbook specifically for UX leaders looking to scale research with the ultimate goal to provide a practical guide on how to empower product teams to run their own research and build and foster that learning muscle within their organizations. So um, Bezad joins me in this companion event to kick off the launch of the playbook. And we are going to be discussing some of the core concepts. We're gonna chat for about 30 minutes or so. And then we've got the last half of the event reserved for more of an AMA kind of Q and A session for you with the audience. So let's kick it off Bezad. I have some Rapid fire questions here for you first, just a few personal okay. questions to get us warmed Perfect. up. Um, and for those of you that may not know Bezad, this might be a good opportunity for you to find out a little bit more about him personally. So first question, oh <laughs> what is something that you can't stop talking about right now? Ooh, I think a conversation I've been having a lot with folks, it's, I mean, this is probably a good example of this, is just the role of relationships in my life. Uh, I, I like using the phrase being in good orbits. You can sort of rotate around people at various intervals, um, some more tightly, some more loosely. And I think what's really magical is like the collisions that happen. So like I interact with someone because I know you. Um, I attribute almost everything in my life that's been successful to being in good orbits. Um, 
And so even, even this book, like being an advisor at Maze for the last two -ish years has just yielded a bunch of interesting opportunities to do stuff like this and partner with ADP List and the, the other great folks who contributed. So. Oh, dude, I love that metaphor. I'm a huge space nerd. And that's just like such a great way of thinking about that and like putting out good energy also into your orbit. So you can attract, you know, more of that coming your way. I love it. All right, what's, uh, what's your post COVID destination trip? I guess we'll use post COVID loosely here. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good, probably Europe. Um, I really, I have some family over there that I haven't seen in a really long time and some great friends that I also haven't seen in a long time. So need to find a way to safely make it over there and spend a couple of weeks. Cute, I love it. What is your favorite thing about your hometown? And where is your hometown? Uh, yeah, so I, I consider Seattle my hometown. Um, I think summer in Seattle is truly undefeated. Like it's just one of the best things in the world. Um, I've been to lots of beautiful places, but like the, I think we like to tell people that Seattle's rainy and terrible all the time because July and August are just incredible. And <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I uh, I also consider Seattle my my hometown, even though I didn't grow up there for the first like 16 years of my life. And I can agree the the Pacific Northwest in especially in the summer is like out of a teenage romance novel. It's like literally head over heels, just idyllic. It's magic. I love it. Uh, all right, last question. What's something to uh, that's on your to be read pile? Um, I don't know if this is like to be read, but a book I'm, I'm slowly chipping away at, I guess, mm -hmm. is this book called Entangled Life. And it's a book all about like fungi. Um, I sort of started a solo book club, maybe like a year and some change ago about organizations as ecosystems. And the goal is to look at other sciences and think about networks and ecology and like how that does or doesn't translate to organizations. So I've been reading a bunch of like plant and soil biology and virology and whatever. And Entangled Life has been like fungi are way cooler than I would have expected and way more interesting and dynamic. Um, so, but it's a dense read. It's a very oh, dense totally. read, so I'm like chipping away at it. <laughs> Yo, I just learned this. So I'm super stoked. How do I get in the book club? Because my uh, associates is in environmental science and like focused on fungi. So I'm, well, this we'll, is really we'll, interesting. We'll follow up. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much for that little warm up. Let's get into the topic. So as I mentioned, we're going to speak to three core concepts. And some of this is um, you know, highlighted through the playbook. The first one we're going to cover is how to communicate the language and value of learning at scale. The second is what leaders can be focusing on right now for building team-wide learning habits. And then the third is um, just taking a look kind of out into the future for organizational learning. So. Under that first prompt, focusing on kind of more of the language and communicating the value of learning, let's maybe have you contextualize this first and maybe talk about how the language of learning has shifted over like the last two to five years. Ooh, yeah, that's a good place to start. I forget who said this. I probably read it somewhere maybe in Christian Madberg's sense-making book, but either from him or uh, maybe more likely from Jan Chipchase in the field study handbook. Uh, but the, just this idea that like a lot of organizations are data rich and insight poor. And I think one of the interesting things that's happened over the last couple of years is we've made access to information a lot easier, especially within organizations. We've started democratizing access to dashboards and databases and BI tools and whatnot and research it in some ways. But what that has led to is people maybe doubling down on things that are closer to confirmation bias or not thinking as deeply about where the data is coming from and what it represents. Um, at UXR, at, yeah, the UXR conference in 2019, I think it was Oveta Sampson who had everyone in the group chanting something like, yeah, they were chanting like all data comes from people. And like, we had this idea that data is really objective, but someone had to choose what got measured and how it got measured and at what frequency and whatnot. And so going back to your question of like how the language of learning has shifted, I think we've gotten over the hump of like having information at our fingertips and we've started to be a lot more thoughtful and pragmatic about what we're using and why. And I think very biasly, like 
one of the helpful conversations that shifted is just the role of talking about things in terms of decisions, not just learning. Like, yes, there are so much data that you can go and learn probably anything you want, but what are you doing with that? Like, why was it worth gathering? Why was it worth collecting? What is it worth doing? Um, something I like to talk to all the teams about is like, research has a cost, but lots of costs, right? It costs you time and energy to plan. It costs your team time and energy to make sense of, to engage with. It costs you time and energy and space to store. It has all kinds of costs on your participants. And you want to think about where are those projects or, or research activities or learning like ROI positive. Um, and I think the decision framing has helped that of like, okay, what are the things that we're trying to do as an organization? What are the actual decisions that we're trying to make? And how do we learn in service of those things? And I think that makes it much more accessible because everyone in organizations makes decisions. Everyone in organizations learns. Some of us don't do it in particularly structured ways. Some of us don't do it particularly well. But when you start to realize that that is actually what's happening everywhere, it changes the conversation from, oh, I need to go do this analysis or I need this model built to we are trying to do a thing and the way that we can increase our confidence in doing that thing or reduce the risk or whatever is by learning and gathering evidence about X, Y, Z thing. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great snippet, like data rich, but insights poor. As a follow-up, like, what do you think shifts the, the you know, needle from just being an organization that collects a bunch of data to being an organization that actually understands and acts upon the right insights? Yeah, I think that some of it is about going slow to go fast. So you, I think about it a lot as like compressing a spring where if you can be more intentional about what you're doing, you end up being you able to make larger leaps and bounds. Um, I talk about this a lot with folks. This example is sort of tongue in cheek, but uh, I have a client who works in security and they were talking about sort of doing interviews and doing it a little bit haphazardly. And I was like, well, I'm not gonna go to a Starbucks and just ask people what they think about SOC 2. Like the, the Titans, for, for those of you who don't know, that's like a, a security standard that shows that you have a certain level of you know, accreditation and certification and whatnot. It's like the average person at Starbucks probably doesn't think about enterprise security software. So yeah, I could go talk to them, but why would I do that? And so I think the, the focus on learning in service of decisions makes you think about like, what are the right inputs so that I can be thoughtful about the outputs? Like who do I need to engage with and in what way so that I'm learning the things that I wanna learn so that we can make the decisions we need to make. And I think that that level of, I've seen more of that intentionality in a lot of different organizations. That's huge. Yeah, learning in service of a decision that's that's being made. That's that's really great. What um what are you, some of the key ingredients that you think um, are part of organizations that learn that are doing you know what you're describing here? Yeah, um, I think I'm totally going to lean on my tagline. Like I talk about doing this in sort of three different ways, like people being intentional, responsible, and sustainable about how they learn. Um, we just talked about being intentional. I think responsible is um, making sure that you have the right people in the right places to facilitate that learning. So there's definitely times where uh, I know people who work in highly regulated environments or in with sensitive subjects. And like, I know that I'm probably not the best person to be doing that. And so either I need to go through training or I need to have someone else do it entirely. Um, and then I think on the sustainability side, like remembering that the people who are participating in your research or, or whatever learning activity are people too, and they're not just like a resource to tap. And you want to think about what's a really sustainable and meaningful two-way relationship there. How do you engage with them because they are the right people and they benefit from the work, not just you benefit from the work. And I think a, one of the things that I love about the playbook that we cover is just the importance of building an operating model for this. So recognizing, you know, going back <clears throat> earlier, like everyone in your organization learns. And so what is the way that everyone can participate in whatever way feels meaningful for them, whether they're producing, engaging, or consuming that work. Um, and I think on that last point, like really figuring out how to make learning visible and accessible to the organization. So who are the people that are going to consume things? Where are they going to consume that? And how do I make sure that I'm reducing the unnecessary friction to getting there? Rather than like just assuming that because I've done work, someone is going to go find it and read it and like do something about it, which you and I both know is not the case. <laughs> totally. 
Uh, yeah, I think um, when you're talking about like the models um, that could be implementable here, like how much does it take for the people that are kind of constructing or contributing to this model? How much does it take, um, you know, as far as like awareness of like the context of that organization? Because I think about it in the terms of like Maze, for example, it's like, you know, rem remote by, um, by design, uh, very asynchronous, um, you know, the types of tooling that we have in our stack, the types of there is definitely diversification and, um, you know, a variety of the ways that different individuals maybe like to consume information, or maybe if they have more of a quant or qual like focus, for example, but um, yeah, totally. I think about that as far as like, yeah, like you've talked about in your appetite for research before. Yeah, 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 there's, there's probably a bunch of different ways we can answer this. Um, I think it matters a lot. Like the, the organization has a big impact on this. And on the 13th page of the playbook, there's a little call out from actually the, the piece you just mentioned about like research practice building blocks. Mm. And these are questions that I've used with folks to think about how they build a map for their research practice, thinking about kind of like the who, what, where, when, why of both the research side of things, like what can you do and who can you support and where can you do this work and whatnot. And then the flip side of like what the organization needs and identifying how to close the gap between those two things. I think that there's <clears throat> like, uh, borrowing this completely from my last boss, Christina Janzer, who runs the research team at Slack. Like one of the first things she did, and she talked about this at the UXR comp in 2020 was like, the first thing you do as a researcher in an organization is study the organization itself. And like, who is involved in what kinds of decision-making, what are their past experiences with research? What does this mean for them? Um, and thinking about how do you make sure that you have an understanding of what those past experiences have been so that you can be successful as an organization. Um, I wrote about this a lot in the organizational appetite for research, thinking about like where people's palates come from and what kind of fuel they need to keep going, right? Do they need snacks? Do they need entrees? Do they need feasts? A lot of that depends. And I think that building an operating model is sort of an iterative process. You're probably gonna start with one team that you work closely with or one part of the company and you're gonna continue to build out as you can support them. The goal is not to make a perfect map of the world. The goal is to think about who are the people that are making different decisions and where do we have the biggest opportunity to harm or do damage to the people that we're trying to serve? How do we stop that from happening? And then how do we start building the other practices on top that go in the right direction? Totally, and echoes that whole sustainability kind of like pillar, <laughs> both like externally and internally exercised. Um, what can you speak to about your observations and connection to this between like learning and innovation? Ooh. Um, I think that one of the things that there's, I forget who said this, but it was like, it was a, it was a great quote that like, you can never AB test your way to a successful product. Like you, I think that one of the things that I enjoy doing as a part of my work and something that is often misunderstood is like research at some of the earliest stages of a company or a product's life are not about the product, they're about the people. And so focusing on a deep understanding of who you're trying to serve, what their problems are, what their lived experiences look like, so that you can understand given the things that your company is trying to do, how to best solve those problems is much more effective than putting a product in front of someone and asking them how to make it better. I think people, regularly say things like, oh, well, Apple doesn't do research and public, you know, it's like, <clears throat> A, that's not true. Like they definitely have researchers there, but I think they also do research in very different ways. Like the reason that, you know, not that I was there, but my imagination would be the reason that the iPod came out was that there was a deep understanding that people had loves of diverse collections of music and an understanding that carrying around a bunch of CDs is not that great. So Apple is thinking, okay, well, what are the things that we can do to meaningfully solve this problem? What are the things that make sense for us as a business? What are the things that we want to manifest in the world? And it was not like, how do we make a better CD player necessarily? It was, how do we give people access to all the music they want with way less friction or overhead or frustration than the current experience? And like, I think that kind of upfront research is often ignored when it comes to innovation. People are always like, oh, well, I'm just going to go like figure out how to make this thing better and make this thing better. And it's like, you're, you're building products and tools to solve problems for people. And without that deep understanding of the people, you're probably not gonna innovate. 
perhaps a, a hard take and I'm sure people disagree, but. I, I mean, I, I'm totally in, in that corner in terms of, you know, thinking about the, the pipeline between understanding, learning and understanding and innovation. Um, and I think even more so now a days where things like user experience is still such an importance, but is becoming like standard and expectation. It's like, you can build a beautiful product, but if it's not for the right people and it doesn't resonate with them, it's not going to go anywhere. So yeah, I love, I love your example there with Apple. I think that's, that's a beautiful example. Moving on to the, the kind of second core concept with what leaders can focus on right now, maybe we can look at the like decision-making in terms of like all of these angles and maybe what the importance is here um, around decision-making in general within the org. Yeah, um, I, I think probably the two biggest recent influences for me when we think about the decision-making stuff is uh, Stuart Butterfield, who is the CEO, who is the CEO at Slack. Um, he, pretty early on in my time there, someone had asked him in a product offsite, like what's one book that, if what's one book you wish we read so that we could better understand you? And he said, Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets. And so a bunch of us went off and read it. And I think it's a really fantastic book because it highlights how everyone makes decisions, but most people do it poorly. And almost every decision we make in, in some way is a bet. And the thing that's helpful about bets is you think about them in terms of like confidence. So one of the best examples to even just articulate like why this framing helps is let's say you and I are gonna go have dinner. If I ask you, what do you wanna eat tonight? And let's say you feel like you, you know, 50%, you feel like you want to go have a burger and 50% you want to go get tacos. And you just choose one of those. You say, I just, I want to get a burger. If I felt 25% burger, 75% tacos, and I say taco, we feel like we're at odds, mm -hmm. but we're actually not. Like you would have been totally satisfied getting tacos. And so the, the big takeaway for a lot of the organizations is that being more nuanced about the beliefs, like why we believe these things, how confident we are in these things, helps us identify how we can close the gap or increase the confidence in the things that we're doing. Um, and so I think that when you think about like what you can do in an organization to help start making progress, I think it's being more articulate about your decisions. Like, why do we believe that this is the right thing to do? And how confident are we? And even I think there's a lot of folks, we talked about this a lot at Reforge, like the value of doing a pre-mortem. Like if things are to go wrong, what do we expect would have been the cause? And if we can in the short term, like how do we mitigate those things or pay attention to them? Um, because I think that the, the reality is very rarely are we 100% certain about things. And so being clear, like, well, we feel 50% confident and we think that if we had this piece of evidence, we'd be 75% confident or 90% confident or whatever. The next thing that that allows you to do is let's say we're launching a feature and we feel, you know, 50, 60% confident, but we can totally roll it back if things don't go well. If our two options are, well, like the right way to go and do research would be spend three months going and doing this, and that'll take us to like 75, 80% confidence, or we can launch this tomorrow and we'll be 100% confident on whether or not it works. Maybe it's not worth three months of research time and customer time and whatever to go do that versus just like doing the thing that then we could roll back. This is like a very trite example, but I think moving towards a direction where you have those kind of conversations makes it easier to think about planning, resourcing, how you're using everyone's time. Um, and it gets the organization on a better place to even have conversations about like research and data literacy. Like, okay, well, how, how are we making this decision, right? Is it me going, yep, cool, let's launch this feature or do we have a strong basis from somewhere? Um, so I think all of those things like really help up-level the organization. Totally. Yeah, and I like um, how you describe kind of those dynamics. Do you think that part of the problem is <clears throat> that some of these like conversations are either happening like siloed or relegated off to like the, you know, the executive team and they're not like having these kind of conversations open in, in the air or is it that they can't necessarily decipher or articulate the, the dimensions around what they're doing in decision making or both? <laughs> I think very rarely people are forced to articulate why they're making decisions they're making. Mm. And there's always gonna be power hierarchies and, and differentials in an organization. And so 
I think the burden is very much on leaders to start articulating why they believe what they believe and what like to kind of show their work, which then makes it easier for other folks in the organization to push at that. Um, Facebook actually, when I was there, I think did a really good job of this. The, the leadership team was pretty good about, like we would do a product review with, you know, whoever VP down of, of different areas. And they were very good about rarely speaking or sharing thoughts. They were always asking questions. And it was like, why do you believe this? Where did this come from? You know, how does this play out? What do you think about this? How would you think about this strategy? And like, it forced us to show our thinking because they never wanted to give us a conclusion without updating how we viewed the world, right? And in a lot of cases, you have someone, even your manager, who has a very different view of things because they manage a bunch of people, work across a couple teams, et cetera. The goal is not to say I'm right, you're wrong. The goal is to say here are different things, here are different inputs I have and how I'm making my decision. And so let me encourage you to start to look for, gather, or use those inputs where you can. Um, a similar thing that I thought Facebook did really well was every Friday, Mark used to do a Q&A. And so he would just get in front of the company and people would ask questions. And that was the fastest way to understand how Facebook strategically was thinking about things because you were just downloading Mark's decision-making frameworks every week. And I think that for, for people who participated, it made it much easier for us as we started thinking through product development or whatever, because we already had an idea of like what mattered going up like where we were trying to go strategically, how we were thinking through trade-offs, et cetera. Um, and so I always encourage leaders to be more explicit where they can about those things because everyone else in the organization benefits downward from that. That's huge. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about like the concept of showing your work. And I think we do that um, to a like grand extent at Maze because we work very asynchronously and, and remotely. Um, but thinking about that from the you know context of a leader being able to kind of show um, the interrogation maybe that they went through in coming to de a decision also helps with alignment. <laughs> Are there yeah. any- and Yeah, and I, uh, I was gonna say, I think in some ways, the, you know, the, the last couple of years have been really difficult for a lot of reasons. I think one positive outcome for a lot of organizations is the shift to writing. Mm -hmm. Like if you just have a meeting, that information is gone when people are gone. <laughs> but the, the act of putting something down and writing and like making that visible for other people as they join becomes really valuable. The process of writing forces you to sharpen ideas in certain ways. And so I think a lot of organizations have naturally gotten better at that by a function of having to write more, which I think a lot of people weren't doing. Um, so I've, I've been positively surprised by the sort of trend there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I love that. And only, I always think about it like um, kind of like a, a relay race, like who's coming behind me to pick up this, you know, after me and how can I make sure that like I'm not using jargon that's like so specific to me or my contacts, like, you know, also keeping the palatability there for like, you know, is it coming in as scattered mess or is it something that's like, you know, honed and focused and maybe only concretely on the things that they need to be worried about. So yeah, that's really interesting. Are there any other um, like practical things that could help teams maybe build in some of these processes and systems either around like learning or the decision-making that comes after them? I mean, I think that talking about it is probably the best first step. And some of that, sometimes when I'll come and work with an organization, I'll actually sit down and we'll look at their roadmap or last couple launches and just like, how do you feel these went? How did you get here? What were the inputs into these decisions? If you could do this over again, what would you look at differently? And and use that not to like do what's called resulting, which is like, we made the right decision because we got the right results, but actually like have a conversation about the process. Like, well, this was totally throwing darts at the wall, but we hit a bullseye. Let's never do that again. But like, how can we get better at those things? Um, I think even understanding, like having conversations with your leadership about how they make decisions, right? So the same Facebook example, we knew that some people were more swayed by emotion, some people were more swayed by data, some people were more shared by, swayed by like customer quotes or how this was gonna impact certain things. And I think, unfortunately, that's often like a shadow map of the world that's held by people who've been at organizations longer. Um, one of the things that I learned from Casey Winters, who's the chief product officer at Eventbrite, was he used to coach people who um, he managed as they were going into reviews of like, these are the kinds of questions you're gonna get. These are the kinds of objections. So these are the, like the lenses that people have to look at your strategy or roadmap or whatever. Make sure that you're accounting for those things. And so I think it's, it's a onus on all of us for as we know that again, write it down. Like this is how XYZ person thinks about these things. Um, there was a, a, he's VP now at Facebook who was very data oriented. 
And so every product manager and the ads team knew that like he would get into the office at eight and from eight to eight thirty, he was looking at every dashboard and he understood them better than most people. And so if anything was going wrong, you needed to have an answer by like eight thirty because you're going to be getting the end. And it was just, it was like an, an institutional knowledge that we had to train. Um, but it was, you'd have one of those experiences and then you'd tell the next person like, Hey, so-and-so cares about these things and here's how you need to think through it. And I think making that decision-making process, you know, visible, like, it's not just that he cares because he wants to know why metrics are going up or down, but like his, he's trying to make other decisions that are predicated on this data. Um, so sharing that stuff becomes helpful. Yeah. And that's like, you know, specifically to what we're talking about, just like kind of equipping teams and leaders with the language to be able to, you know, do this. Um, it's not just the language of like the questions, but then the language of, um, and the familiarity of being able to share these kinds of things, um, you know, with your team so that you kind of have this conversation more frequently. Um, transitioning into our kind of third core concept here, kind of this nicely transitions into a look toward the future. You've said that, you know, learning is part of everyone's role. It's just oftentimes not done very consistently and oftentimes without the support of systems. Um, and I think in, in 2020 at UXRConf, you um, talked about the importance of shifting the focus specifically within UX research, uh, you know, from the artifacts of that work to, and, um, you know, the activities that maybe make that possible and more into the, like, role of the researcher as a teacher um, instead of just you know kind of becoming these oracles so thinking about like the industry and the leaders that are at the helm of this how should we look at constructing not just the mechanisms and systems to make this work feasible but also like the competencies of learning um, for instance i'm thinking about like what does this mean for individuals within this role like how can they approach bolstering these skills or enhancing this part of their work yeah, that's a great question. Um, so many different things to, to answer there. Um, I would say that the, let me pull something up because I don't wanna, I don't wanna say this wrong. Um, I, I care about citing. Um, so yes, I think that the, I, uh, and I'm sure we can drop the, the D Scout people nerds link in at some point, but, um, I definitely think that one of the problems I saw early in my career and I still see is this, this focus on researchers as being oracles. And I, when I say that, I mean two things. I mean that like we're the only people who understand the customers and then our primary engagement with the rest of the organization is having answers. And I don't think that's sustainable for us. Like we're never going to be in every customer conversation. We are never going to be at every touch point. And I don't think we should. Um, I think it's better for us to have more people engaging in the practice of learning so that we get more voices and more perspectives out there. Um, Justin Dreckold and Lena Blacksock have this great cooking metaphor that I borrowed a ton and I think they're both incredible thought partners in this. But if you think about doing research as like making a meal, there's all sorts of baseline skills that people need to have to do it safely. They need to understand knife skills. They need to understand when meat is readily cooked. They need to think about sequencing. You need to think about and part of that question of like, what are the competencies is what needs to happen for different people in my organization. I think in the, in the piece I wrote about democratization is our job. I talk about the sort of spectrum of risk and how there's three different buckets of things. There's stuff that only researchers should be doing. There's stuff that researchers can help other people do. And then there's stuff that researchers will just like sort of make safe. And I love Lena and Justin's cooking metaphor there because for each of those buckets, there's different skills that I expect. Like in some cases, you know, if you think about even a, a restaurant, right? The chef is the person who probably makes the menu and is cooking specific things because he or she needs to be involved in doing that. Then there's a bunch of people who can do this other level of things. And there's a bunch of people who are just chopping. And I think that lends for the organization of how do we right size people's impact or sorry, uh, engagement so that they have the impact they want is a really good question. And some of that is going to be very contextual to your company. So Lena and Justin are both at HashiCorp, which is a very technical company that supports developers. The average like level of fluency in certain spaces for a person to go and engage with the customers is much higher. Like I probably can't do any of their jobs or talk to any of their customers. If I join their team, I have a research lens, but they're going to need to teach me certain things so that I can go and do that work. Um, and so I think a lot of this is, again, it's like a self-awareness exercise for the organization, right? Who's making what decisions, what evidence do they need to make those decisions and how do we effectively help them 
not do harm, not gather the wrong thing, but actually like move the needle forward in, in really meaningful ways. Um, one of the things that we did at Slack, which I thought was super helpful, was we worked with the customer success team that was sending hundreds of surveys to thousands of accounts. They were using different language, they were using a couple of different platforms. And so we recognized this was super critical to their work. And so what we wanted to do was instead of training all of them in like how to do surveys, you know, over the course of many months, we looked at all the things they were trying to do. We built standard templates. We, you know, got them Qualtrics accessed. And then we started building out these training modules. But the first thing was like, cool, we understand the five common things you're trying to do. Here's exactly how you need to do it. Just change the name of your company. And I think there's, you know, that leveled into certain people being more interested in surveys, more involved in the process of constructing these things, building new templates themselves. But that wasn't the baseline expectation for everyone on the customer success team. Yeah, totally. And I, I love the, meta I mean, so many great metaphors in this session, but I really love that metaphor because what I was going to ask is, you know, how much does this, especially this trend towards the future where UX researchers are, you know, kind of uh, potentially more um, looking at their impact on others versus like the outcome of just their individualized work. So like um, becoming more like involved in the actual design of a learning environment versus the actual like you know competency within UX research and it sounds like you know taking that like chef approach the chef is still doing some of the critical work that's reserved for the chef but is helping to facilitate all of the you know other line cooks and, and sous chef and things like that so that's great what skills um, should hiring managers be looking for in non-UX researchers knowing that they should be constructing a team who can learn within their own role Ooh, that is a good question. I think self-awareness is probably one of the most important skills. I think mm -hmm. also uh, acknowledgement and respect for sort of those different boundaries. Um, thinking about like, assuming you want to contribute in a certain way, there's probably a set of skills you need to, like you don't get to make a steak unless you can use a knife successfully and know when the meat is going to be done, right? Like, mm -hmm. and those are going to look different for your organization. Um, I think some of it is about even understanding how to engage with someone in a thoughtful way that's not transactional or not just getting the answer you want. I had a terrible experience at a former company where we got on a call and the product manager was like, hey, I'm just here to get you to figure out how to spend more money. And I was just like, Whoa. the next hour of my life is going to be miserable. Like, how did we get here? Uh, I built I, I built the first version of like research training pretty soon after that. <laughs> nice. um, yeah. Good catalyst. I, I think I think there's this like you want to have a genuine curiosity and respect for the people that you're trying to serve. And and I use that language very intentionally because like humans are the atomic unit of business, right? Both your colleagues and your customers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that customer is a dirty word because if I'm building something meaningful, like it should have someone who's using it. And I, I want to understand that relationship. Um, and so I think that finding people who view those relationships less as exploitative and more as like engaging and relationships and want to bring people along in that process of building are, are going to be more successful. Um, I definitely prevented certain people from getting on calls because I didn't think that it was going to be a good experience for the participant or a respectful relationship. And again, like being the person who's building those risk and operating models, like that's part of my role saying, look, this is going to be a bad experience. Like you do not get to do this and it's not easy. It's not fun, but it's important for the customer and for the business. I think that's so great to articulate that intention and like calling out explicitly where those like swim lanes are um, and the risk is really important. I mean, it goes back to what you were talking about as far as like the core tenets of being able to do this at scale also ensures that the people that are facilitating the work aren't, you know, undermining. <laughs> um, so that's, that's hugely important. Um, I, with about 20 minutes left, that kind of concludes our, um, our three segments that we wanted to, to highlight. I can take questions from the audience, and this can be you know, specific questions if you've already had the opportunity to check out the playbook. Um, it can be um, kind of an AMA, freeform style, anything about Bezad, <laughs> um, the making of the playbook. Um, yeah, let's, uh, I'm going to, as I'm 
looking through the chat here, I'm going to start to pull out some of those questions. So feel free to chime into the chat. Um, and apologies in advance if I don't pronounce your name correctly. Um, let's see. So I'm just going to answer some of these technical questions here. Um, Nita asks, what was the book's name again? So, oh, the book uh, that you were talking about earlier, yes, it was Thinking in Bets. The name of the playbook, though, is Democratizing Research to Deliver Impact at Scale, in case anybody was looking for that. Um, can the playbook link be shared again? Cool, we got that. Um, let's see if there's any other questions in the chat here. And feel free as people are just kind of um, digesting is some of the content that we've been talking about here. Um, I know from like a curiosity standpoint, at least from my side, what we've been chatting about, um, and, and we've facilitated discussion before in other channels. So, uh, I know we've kind of casually discussed this, but I'm thinking about, um, the, the role as a UX researcher and kind of like the adjacent things that are, might be nearby or the, the territories that UX researchers can maybe, um, you know, borrow from in terms of um, instructional design or organizational design or even anthropology, it sounds like from, you know, a lot of the stuff that you were discuss discussing. Um, so are there any kind of like key things that you think about in terms of those other practices or have you ever encountered a yeah. situation where you've rubbed shoulders against those guys? Oh, I'm, I'm sure I've rubbed shoulders in a lot of ways. Um, I've made this point in a couple of places, but I, I think one of the things that the decision framing lets you do is sort of push on the idea that research is actually infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about building certain types of infrastructure for your organization, you're asking a question like, how do we support different things? I think you can pull from service design, from organizational design, from anthropology, sociology, behavioral economics. Um, I've been reading a lot. <laughs> environmental <laughs> science, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I think yeah. there's a, like, if you start with the idea that, you know, an organization is a bunch of people who are trying to accomplish a thing, they need to make decisions, they need to show their work, they probably are trying to make, you know, move fast and, you know, hopefully not break things. Um, there's a lot of different ways you want to pay attention to the human dynamics there. And um, one of the things I've read recently that's been really great that um, is about this idea of like middle status conformity. So the idea that like um, basically the only people who deviate from, who, who deviate or are deviants in their behavior in an organization are people who are so high status that they're untouchable and so low status that they are unafraid to lose everything. And that's really problematic because what it means is the average, like the majority of people in your organization are just trying to do things that feel really safe. And I think it's a, it's like an interesting economics human incentives lesson to think about how to better facilitate behaviors, experiences, raise voices, et cetera, that are going to actually move the organization forward. It's a really good lens for thinking about why a lot of voices are silenced or hindered or people don't speak up, right? They have too much to lose. And I, I think a lot about how do we change that dynamic? Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's like so many different fields to pull from when you think about organizations as like a complex adaptive system to pull from, you know, plant soil biology, yeah. um, like what are the different, different things there? I, I do see a fun question in the chat. I, um, yeah, I see it here too. I was going to ask, <laughs> I um, guess for the recording, I'll, I'll, in case we don't have the, yeah, the yeah. chat here, I'll say it. Um, it, let's see, Robert wants to reverse the question back on Faisad. What's a book that you would recommend for us to get to know you better? I love the question. Um, I'm going back and forth between two, which are both books that I've recommended to a lot of people. Um, the first one is Essentialism. Mm. And it's sort of a, it's like a shift on minimalism, but it's it's more about like a pragmatic take on having and like doing things in a way that feels true and authentic without overburdening. Um, there's a great quote that like, you know, the things you own, own you. And I think mm -hmm. a lot about the weight of like owning something and um, both in terms of work, like the responsibility of being the driver or the champion of something and what that means and who I'm accountable to, as well as like, I'm about to move 
from an apartment to a condo and like I have things that I have to take with me and it's like are they really worth having because now I have to move them around mm -hmm. um the other book that I really love is from the school of life it's called an emotional education and it's a very it's kind of like a practical philosophy book about the ways that romanticism has ruined a lot of our notions of like love and relationships and that most of us don't know ourselves well enough and beyond that are very often the i'm going to totally butcher this quote but it's, it's a beautiful quote of like um unbeknownst to most of us we are all like the inheritance we all are the we've all received like an emotional inheritance that we're unaware of and like didn't choose mm -hmm. and very often like don't know how to grapple with and so it talks about the ways that we show up for friends and for partners and for other people in the world based on like how we received or didn't receive love in our early stages and the way that we positively or negatively associated with that and it has all these like practical takes on you know how to deal with the emotional roller coaster of being a human and mm -hmm. how the idea that like no one is actually normal when you look close enough and so many of these things that we build up as projections are like social Handed truths down. but not real truths yeah it's, yeah it's a really good book um it's a very fast read and i think it has a lot of very applicable life skills just for like being a better human in the world um and i i think it also just relates to you know what i was thinking about when you were talking uh about the previous point around like creating the environment or the ecosystem within an organization for this to even occur that goes back to like you know the the energy exchange between humans the you know rank and file the construction of you know what is it like to have vulnerability within a team or to be wrong um, about something like there's trust that also is incorporated here it's like these things um, may not be talked about enough kind of within the ux research kind of um, you know, talk track maybe, but I think is definitely aspects that um, UX research can certainly lead the charge on, which is beautiful to see. Um, yeah, I would hope so. Yeah, I see that you got, um, where did you read about middle status uh, conformity? Is that, um, is that what uh, you just answered in, in the chat? I don't know. If yeah, I, I dropped in, um, the paper is called middle status conformity theoretical restatement and empirical demonstration in two markets but i dropped in a link from what i wrote about reading that paper on like specifically what we were just talking about and kind of i call it the importance of cultural gardening and so like asking yourself you know where are certain behaviors happening or not happening and how do you think about weeding or planting new seeds Wow. Dude, you're like the the Michael Pollan of research. I love this. <laughs> He's like one of my favorite writers too. It's like the botany of desire is over here from uh, for organization well, that, to learn. <laughs> that is that is uh yeah. I like I'm I'm very honored by that idea. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, the gardening metaphors too are just like um and even just thinking about like data and insights, right? It's like this gardening yeah. and pruning and like understanding of like good data in, good data out, like how this totally. whole thing it's, it all folds into each other. Um, Kelly asks, how do you overcome some of the resistance people have to learning these additional or new skills in an org? Most common seems to be, I don't have time. It's a great objection. <laughs> totally. That. Totally. No, Kelly, that's a fantastic question. Um, there's probably a couple of different ways we've approached it. Um, some feel like they're more carrot. Some feel like they're more stick. Actually, given that we have an international audience, um, some of them are more like, how do I incentivize a certain behavior and the other one is how do I like prevent you from doing bad things or like punish you for for things um I think on the incentive side very often what I try to think about is where I can reframe the spaces that are between our roles or like the things that I'm trying to help you do as me actually helping you do your job mm -hmm. so in the customer success example I was talking about with slack like they were going to send surveys whether we wanted them or not what I was trying to do and my team was trying to do was say, how do we make you more successful in action that you are already doing and an action that you need for your job? So it's not that we're trying to like impose survey methodology on you for no reason. It's we think you're going to be better off. You're, the data that comes back will now be comparable to our quarterly tracking surveys. Our customers will probably be happy. Like there's all these benefits here. And so I think that that alignment and benefit orientation is helpful. On the flip side, there's definitely like learning from bad experiences and saying like, I can't bring you in front of a customer unless we've had a certain set of conversations because I don't trust that 
this relationship will not be damaged and that can have a meaningful impact on the business. So one of the rules we used to have at Facebook because we would take, uh, I used to take a lot of folks into the field. It was like, if you never came to a lab session in the lab that we had, you never got to get on a plane. And it was just like, like this is a very low stakes thing. If you can't walk a couple buildings over and engage in research and participate in a debrief and understand what's going on, I can't take you to some other city in the world to do the same thing, right? Like this is the lowest friction version of the thing versus like an actual engagement. Um, and so I think it's a balance of saying these things are important to move the company forward. And like, you have to participate in a certain way because it can be harmful or damaging with, I'm doing this to help you. And I think you have to be genuine about that, right? Like you're not trying to tell people how to do their job for no reason. You're trying to say like, we're moving in a certain direction and I want to help increase the leverage of however you get there. Yeah. And just like what you've been talking about in terms of, you know, UX researchers being able to set the tone through their coaching and teaching. I think if you set that relationship, right, there should be that natural, you know, kind of looking towards you for the order of which to operate. So um, I think that it all predicates on those relationships, as you mentioned. Um, Kenny asks, what's the best way to ensure the research insights and knowledge doesn't get lost with the changes in roles, personnel shifting, people coming in, having it all in their head and then leaving and it's all still in their head, perhaps. Yes, I'm looking up an article that I just shared with someone else um, that I think will be helpful. So uh, I totally hear you on that problem. Um, one of the things that I really struggle with with a lot of research repositories is that they put the onus on the person who's looking for the research to know that something happened and where to find it. I think that is wildly problematic. Um, but I think that the research operations, like the research ops community has done a great amount of work on repositories and I'm dropping in a link here um, that they shared recently of like framing some of those things. Um, they have a specific name for what I'm about to talk about. So I'm just gonna crack open the article real quick and talk, and make sure that I'm leveraging their names correctly. Um, they call it a library. Well, so I guess the, the like way that I would answer the question directly is at Slack, one of the things we did is we basically built a wiki and this was a set of questions that, or a set of topics that answered the question, what do we know about a given topic? And this is what we expected folks who were doing any research in the space to contribute to. Um, and it was meant to be read, written as like a one-ish page thing using very human language that had lots of citations and links out to other things, where if you were new to the company, you could read this set of what we know about pages and get a high level view of all the things that we believe to be true, which we regularly updated. It pointed out to all the research, but instead of asking like, well, how do people feel about Slack's brand? And then reading 300 pages of, you know, present like Google slides, you could just go read the one pager and anywhere you wanted to dig deep, you'd go and do that. And so I think that the, like, again, going back to how do you make certain things consumable to different audiences? Like, I don't want most people going through our research repository and digging through slides. I want them to pay attention to the information that hasn't decayed, that doesn't, you know, like is fresh and good and has like well-cited sources. And then if they want to, they can go and read other things. And I think a lot of people over-index on building the repository first, rather than that sort of wiki or that front page. Um, again, reasonable people will disagree with me here. And, and I think a lot of people have spent a lot of time digging into this practice. This is what worked for us at Slack. The other benefit was that it helped us because we wrote these as kind of question and answers. Like, what do we know about this? If we didn't have an answer, we just said, well, we're not sure, but Ash is gonna work on this in Q3. And so if I was interested, I would go and bother Ash and be like, hey, this is relevant to what we're doing. You know, Can I make sure that we're plugged in? Um, but I think it's it's about having different fidelities of data for your different audiences, right? One of the things that was super helpful was when I ran the tracking surveys, I used to have people pinging me for like, what's our NPS and CSAT and all those other things. As soon as we started doing this, I just kept posting this link and then people stopped asking me because every quarter they knew that the survey would come in and they would just go get the updated scores. Um, and so I think this was a really helpful way to operationalize and like systematize that kind of practice. Totally, and builds that muscle, like you said, like is the habit because then after time, the patterns start to build and people start to have these like kind of ingrained into the culture. I was gonna ask oh, as a follow-up to that, like what do you think is the, what was the point in which this happened? Like what 
point in the scale of Slack did this occur? Is this something that you guys created in anticipation anticipation of the of kind of growing, or is it something that happened as kind of a result of the growth? I think it was two separate things. I think it was we were growing and we wanted to stop spending time answering these questions. So we realized that we needed to put them in a place that was visible. I think the other thing is that because we wrote them as plain text with citations and charts and whatever, we opened the sphere of participation for everyone else who's doing these things. So if you're a customer success manager for a major client and you have a great quote or a great experience or a great data point that you want to contribute to one of these pages, you can do that because it's just editable text, right? And I think that was one of the ways that we opened up and said like, look, you all are contributing to how we learn as an organization. In fact, here you have edit access to this company knowledge. And um, you know, each of us were sort of responsible for again, tending to those gardens on a regular basis. But the goal was that like, we weren't gatekeeping or siloing who could participate because they were on a learning team or like in a learning mm -hmm. discipline. It was like, all of you are doing things that are really helpful. And so contribute where you can. Customer support teams dropped in ticket links to citations or uh, you know reports that they ran based on traffic or trends or whatnot. I mean, I think that helped everyone feel more involved in that practice. Wow. Yeah. And like not, as you've said, over indexing on like the engineering of the repository or the library, but thinking about, you know, like, what is this? Because I'm even thinking of, you know, some teams that the researchers or even like, you know, maybe, maybe PMs or designers are the only ones that have access. You know, it's like a tooling like yeah. bottleneck because there's not even, you know, like a possibility of people getting into certain tools and seeing that information. So when it breaks out of that model, um, it certainly opens it up much better for scale, as you said. Totally. And, and I think there's a pragmatic thing, right? Like at, at Slack, our, the research team, there were very few teams that had access to customer information. And so one of the things that was important was we, we were able to share things that the rest of the company could consume based on their level of permission, which means we had to start building these other spaces to protect our customers. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of like a, a balance of, you know, working with the legal team and the privacy team to say like, what are the policies we want to build and how do we sort of operationalize these in the artifacts or the practices that we have to best serve the customer, right? Like we don't want certain information getting out there and, and like legally it can't, so we have to do something about this. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's tremendous. I mean, I love every opportunity I get to, to chat with you. There's always like more things to read, which I'm always stoked about and more metaphors. Uh, and it's just like such a, a great um, you know, burst of, of clarity in terms of you know, so what something is very Ooh. hot topic right now. Um, but absolutely love your thoughts on, on this. Did There's you say a, something like that? Well, I was going to say related to that. This isn't necessarily a, to answer Robert's question, but um. There's a fantastic, I, so my undergrad was in rhetoric and Metaphors We Live By is a book by Lake <laughs> Often Johnson that is just like fantastic for thinking about narrative and communication and whatnot. Um, so if you right do a lot of down. speaking, yeah, if you, if you want something to read, um, it's a, it was a very formative book for me in undergrad. Well, at a later topic, I for sure want to discuss your, um, you know, kind of experience through like more of a lens of storytelling, because I believe that that's another aspect we haven't covered today, but it's certainly something that um, I think helps to democratize that learning and make it in a way that is not just consumable, but is memorable as we all think and remember and resonate with stories. So it would be interesting to have your take on that too, but I'll, I'll take this book as a primer. Um, thank you so, so much for tuning in today. This has been such an awesome opportunity to collaborate yet again with ADP List. Um, I really want to like, show my expression of uh, appreciation for everyone, not just in the event, but also for the support on the playbook on Product Hunt. Um, we'd really love to hear your thoughts once you've had an opportunity to uh, download and read it and feel free to let us know what you think. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Helen. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you, Ash. Thank you, Bazad. This was an amazing session. I think I can speak for all of the people here. Like it was lovely to hear you, the energy, the insights, the clarity, as you said, like amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so generously with us and you know being part of this community with us super super grateful once again thank you so much for this project thank you so much for all the effort for showing up and sharing so much with us um yeah everybody keep an eye out on 
I, I think I don't need to recommend right now, but like, you know, keep an eye out because of course there's more coming. I feel like this is Definitely. one of the amazing things that the people in our community are doing. And of course, I think this is a great example of Ash Bazod, like Maze is just an amazing partner. So thank you so much for everything today. Thank you so much, everyone. This recording will be shared in our YouTube channel later on, and I'll hope to see you around in other ADP List events. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks for hosting us. Yeah, thank you so much. Our pleasure. Okay, see you around, Take care, everyone. everyone. Take care.